Hello guys, I hope you are all fine. Welcome at the World of Music Tech Virtual Summit 2020. So it's no time for our next panel. It's around music tech and health and wellness. Our awesome panelists are Sarah Sarah, and also she's the host of the panel. Erwin um, Lebe, co-founder and CTO at Lucid. And yes, we are live um, in a few minutes. Uh, Stephen Loray is professor of neurology and director at Coma Science Group will also come on the panel. So guys, thank you very much for being with us. The stage is yours. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for being with us today. Um, we're going to talk about music, tech and um, mindfulness or well-being. Um, thanks Aaron for being here. Um, as we are going to talk about mindfulness, I'd like to start with a 10 breath meditation if that's all right. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're just going to ground our feet and um, yeah, do 10 breath and I will bring us back. Come back whenever you're ready. Thank you for that. So we are waiting for Stephen that should join us in a minute. Um, but I guess we can start. So I would like to start with um, your journey to mindfulness. So I think that it started pretty much around 99 when the Dalai Lama uh, came, came to us, came to the West, and he started to talk about um, secular spirituality, which means that um, basically spirituality is not is not um, associated with religion anymore, and we can practice it like everyone can practice it, and that's really important for for everyone. Um, and yeah, so I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you came to it, and yeah, what's your journey? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question, and I think um, like that whole kind of speech when he came to the West and really brought that concept forward, I think is really when, you know, the seed was planted, right? Like my meditation now is like, especially in the West has kind of exploded right into this like massive industry and, um, you know, digital and technology has become a part of it because uh, people are really onto it. And I think religions are like, and especially like the traditional dogmas of religions are, are kind of in a decline, right? So people in my generation tend to be um, really into it. So for me, I was lucky. My mother um, actually attended one of the Dalai Lama talks um, when he was in the West. Uh, so she was all about it when I was uh, very young. So I was introduced to mindfulness and meditation at a young age. So I was able to kind of transcend that into my adult uh, adult life. Um, so I do it now as a part of my professional practice, but I would say as a personal um, kind of my own practice, I, I was involved with meditation from age 13 or so. Um, and the mindfulness process kind of attached to it. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, so I guess I'll, I'll talk um, a little bit my my journey. So yeah. I started to get interested in meditation. Um, well, I came to it through philosophy, I guess, through studies. And, you know, I studied um, uh, pre-Socratic philosophers and, yeah, they were, like, all about it. And um, just, like, less is more and take care of your body and you know try to be very mindful of what you put in it what you eat and yeah just practice meditation so yeah so that's how it started and then it's just like it's an ongoing process so you know once you start you just like 
exactly. your forever student basically um and and yeah and i guess that you know nowadays it's like one of the biggest industries in the world like when we talk about yoga and meditation um it's yeah. it's everywhere and um i guess that technology has to has to you know deal with it as well and we have to find a way i guess to incorporate that um in the technological world so um i guess that my my next question is try to understand the like what happens in the body when um when uh, you're happy or when you're anxious and what is like the mecha mechanics behind it um and how to meditation um like improves it in general so yeah I mean, that, that's that's a great question, too. I think um, I'm lucky that a lot of the early research that went into Lucid, which is the company that I co-founded, um, revolved a lot around studying just that, right? So like what happens in the brain during a meditation process? And what we try to do at Lucid is we actually try to induce meditation through music without kind of, you know, so you and I have both experienced kind of the traditional, you know, this is how you like center your breath. This is how you kind of get into meditation. Um, what we uh, kind of our call to action was, a lot of people who are dealing with severe mental health challenges who have difficulties kind of getting into that headspace. Uh, so this solution that we've created uses machine learning to actually measure um, levels of, of meditation that people are achieving and kind of re-recommending music and immersive content to help them get there quicker um, and almost like flex those muscles. So, so kind of the brain does just that. Basically, when you're in a meditative state, um, the electrical activity in your brain is kind of concentrated, right? So different meditations can stimulate different neurological responses. So for an example, um, a, a focused attention meditation stimulates what's called beta wave activity, right? And that's you know the brain waves that are kind of associated with heightened focus, but it's centralized as opposed to kind of a lot of the noise that normally happens um, in, your, in your brain. Um, you know, there's uh, kind of more of the mindfulness uh, meditations, which are kind of alpha band frequencies. And then there's transcendental meditations, which are like theta, right? Which is very kind of, you know, leaving your body and getting, getting that kind of escape, right? So I think uh, the cool thing about meditation is there's visible both from like EEG bands, and we've seen it because they've done these really cool trials on monks where they'll put EEG readers on them and, and watch the brain waves, and um, and you can see visible changes in that activity when when you're in a meditative state. So really, what um, we're trying to do is um, is kind of stimulate that essentially through our technology um, without kind of the, the process of getting there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting the, the there is actual visible compounding effects of the brain that science has kind of uh, visibly seen, right? And anxiety is kind of just the opposite of that. It's basically just extra noise, right? Um, you have the chemical uh, GABA, which is kind of lacking during that state. And basically your brain is kind of just all over the place, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. And so you, you, sorry, you're using um, immersive technology to convey that. And so do you find that um, it amplifies the effects or the benefits or how, how does it work? Yeah, so in, in our case, we do immersive audio. Uh, so we, we've done a lot of testing, um, like VR is another great tool for, for meditation practices. Uh, our company is more interested in, in the music side. Uh, so what we've done is um, we've done multiple multitudes of testing and, and yeah, it definitely amplifies it. I would say music um, is another thing that has the ability to do concentrated brain activity, right? Um, the challenge with music, however, is that it's the right music at the right time is, is kind of this really important thing, right? If your brain is in a certain state and you're played, you know, and it's very personal too, right? Like I might relax to something that you see, you sound as intuitively relaxing or I could relax to like Metallica or something, right? Like everybody has a very different um, response to music, but music has that ability as well to kind of concentrate um, electrical activity in the brain, um, much like a meditative a med meditative practice, right? So, you know, being that those two things have similar outputs, kind of our thesis is we can have a prolonged experience if, if we can learn which music we need to play at the right mm -hmm. moment, at the right time for each user, right? So it sounds like an impossible task, but when you start to use um, emerging technologies like machine learning, it becomes a lot easier. Um, okay. Because you just you learn what works for each individual, and you can kind of mm. re-prescribe that experience. And the immersion factor, I think, is is really important too, because immersive media brings you outside of where you are, 
right? And I think that's a really important thing um, for these simulated experiences, right? Is that you, you wanna almost take the user out of the, their situation. Um, and immersive media has an amazing way of doing that, right? It's just like transformative. You feel like you're, you're leaving somewhere, right? And, um, so it can be very therapeutic if it's done right. Cool. Um, yeah, to, coming back to music, um, I'm, I'm studying Jayotish at the moment, which is um, Vedic astrology, um, which is in the Ayurveda as well. Yeah. Um, and we are talking about mantras and dashas, which are the sounds that, you know, corresponds to your vibration um, related to your birth chart. So basically, you know, a baby is born, is he has a birth chart and in when you look at his sun sign and moon sign and ascendant, you have like a sound. And mm -hmm. apparently that is the like the sound that you should listen to and the mantras that you should chant. And so yeah, so I was just wondering, do you have like any sort of, you know, do you have like things like that that you use or yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. So like I'm very interested uh, in that space. I think like we haven't explored any um, interactive voice uh, coming from the user. And I think that's something that we're really interested in getting into at some point in time, because I, I've seen really interesting research around mantras and I think they're they're very powerful. Um, I personally don't know nearly as much as you do probably around uh, the power that they have, but I think one of the things that we want to do at Lucid eventually is have kind of a more interactive experience where the user can actually speak or sing or you know what I mean kind of communicate with the technology that we're providing um and I think mantras would definitely be a part of that for sure um very interested yeah, yeah. I guess because your brain must react like you know differently um whether sure. you know yeah. everyone has their own vibration and you're going to react differently and so I think that you know that could be interesting to for sure just um sure. yeah incorporate that into your your yeah, the immersive space. Um, yeah. yeah, great. And do you have anything that you would like to add regarding the immersive? Um... Oh, I mean, I, I, I do think that um, it's a new frontier, but um, I think that like it's something that we should all definitely be, be thinking about in the wellness space, right, is immersive media. And I think that there's this kind of disconnect where there's a lot of immersive media practitioners who are doing amazing things. Um, and then there's a lot of people in the meditation space and um, it seems like music is an intuitive thing, and, but like immersive media still hasn't really made a, a massive uh, impact on the meditation space. And I think it can. Um, so I would just encourage people to, to think about it. Um, yeah. And so uh, how does it work for you? Like, how are you reaching out to people? Like, yeah. mm. do people come to you or is it yeah, like a so, therapy or? Yeah. So we have a digital product, uh, just a mobile application, um, and we do immersive audio for that one. So that's binauralized audio um, that basically, you know, they're instructed to kind of go to uh, like, you know, their, their room, lay down, you know what I mean? Turn off the lights and then close their eyes, right? And then from there, uh, the audio really takes them to another place. So we've, we've gotten spatialized audio recordings of nature and, and all of our music is spatialized in a binaural space. Um, so that's kind of one of the experiences that we do. Uh, the other is we have an installation, which is kind of a more fully immersive environment where we, we've created this like structure that people enter and, and, and do the intervention um, in a live setting, right? So uh, that's something that we brought around uh, to different events and festivals. Um, and that one um, is kind of more on, a, um, on an event-based uh, kind of uh, system. So I would say like our, our, our more, most distributed immersive experience is the mobile application. Um, but I would say that um, even those restraints um, are becoming a lot easier now, right? Even VR can be done now with mobile phones, with, with the right kind of uh, setups, right? So I think that as, you know, as a lot of that technology becomes more ubiquitous, um, I think that we'll be seeing a lot more of it being used in the wellness space. Um, it has a lot of potential for sure. Yeah, yeah. And so you, you started uh, directly with immersive technology or were you there mm -hmm. before as well or? Yeah, yeah. So like we started directly with immersive technology. Um, okay. and, uh, I think we, um, like at least kind of my vision in terms of the user experience was it to be so like tra like kind of transportational, like so immersive that um, it becomes easier for the user to get into that meditative state quicker, right? Because like, obviously we have our machine learning and all this other stuff, but 
if the user is already immersed in an environment that's like pleasant um, with like nature sounds and all this other stuff, we've, we've already made it a lot easier for us to get there, right? Um, you know, I, I, I kind of, what I try to do is like, I pictured my best meditations and tried to work backwards. Like, you know, like what, like why, why did it feel so good? Why did I, you know what I mean? And, and try to kind of recreate that, that experience um, through immersive media um, experience essentially. Right, and how do you, how do you measure the benefits? Yeah, so we, uh, there's a number of different tools that we've used. Uh, so we're starting to play a lot with uh, voice biometrics. So people's kind of like people talking um, to and doing voice commands, you can actually um, measure quite a bit of biometric insights from a person's voice. Uh, the other is we have the uh, kind of a, a self reporting panel that we've designed with uh, a number of neurologists, um, where basically the user can kind of tell us using um, you know, different smart tools around how, how like how they self report like how they're feeling during after before and after um, kind of the experience. We also have worked with um, biometric wearables as well. Um, so kind of heart rate variability is a nice one um, because it can let us know how people are feeling um, in terms of their sympathetic and parasympathetic response. Not as good as an EEG, um, which is something that we've yeah. done a lot of research with. Uh, so in, in our, our clinical and research studies, we use EEG readers, um, but in our product environment, it's very difficult to have people use to those. Do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I, sorry, go ahead. Um, I guess it would be interesting to see that, like, you know, how yes. people react, like, before they come to your... Yeah. Oh, definitely. Thing. And I think the, um, that's why when we do our studies, we always use EEG because it's the strongest um, measurement tool that we can, we can like, yeah. kind of benchmark, right? Mm. So luckily, our studies go have been going quite well um, with, with that level of measurement. But kind of my job is really I'm trying to get that level of quality, you know, into the most mobile of users, right? Because um, kind of, you know, it's, it, it's easy to assume that people have a smartphone. I mean, that's, that's that, you know, 76% of North Americans have a smartphone. Um, I'm sure the European statistics are very high as well. Um, but an at-home EEG reader is, you know, yeah. not something that's very feasible at the moment. So. Mm. Interesting. And... And do you know, like, who, who's your audience? Do, do you, how do you work? Like, um, is it like a therapy thing that, you know, doctors would prescribe or, or is it just people coming to you? Or? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's kind of right now, it's just a consumer mobile application. So you could just find it oh, yeah. on, the, on the App Store. Um, we are working towards uh, building a digital therapeutic product that would be more in like a health setting, uh, something that a doctor could uh, recommend or prescribe. Um, that takes a couple of years of clinical trials. So that's what we're working on right now. It's like proving that it's actually um, effective and that it's working, um, that it's safe, right? These are all things that um, is kind of on our current benchmark. I mean, the safety factor is pretty pretty easy just because it is music um, and it's it's not um, much else uh, than that. But yeah. um, but I think the uh, currently it's, uh, it's it's just an app essentially and it's in the wellness space. And it's um, doing quite well. Our audience, um, I would say, is definitely more of the younger, um, the younger crowd. Uh, I would say like between ages um, 18 to like 38 is like our kind of core demographic. Um, but uh, yeah, we have definitely exceptions to that too. Um, but it's it's a, a lot of just app users who um, tend to use yeah. technology for mindfulness already. Uh, so people who will use like Headspace or Calm will also use um, our mobile product as well. Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, I guess like you are at the at the door of the of the of the world of mindfulness because it's just you know um, all the traditional users like you know people that are studying the actual philosophy and mm -hmm. and um, you know traditional practice. Uh, but now you've got like all these people using apps and stuff, and I feel like I don't know mindfulness is just such a thing that you know you you have like a huge um, potential audience and um yeah it's very exciting yeah and i think um, a lot of, like the discourse around it now everyone everyone seems to be very open to it right where like i, yeah. I remember even when i was like in high school when i was doing meditation because my again my mother kind of got me into it at a young age um it was such a foreign idea to my friends and you know what i mean like it like the it was, it was especially in in, in america because that's where i was living at the time um it was just not you know not a common common thing right so yeah now, now it's just, yeah. Now it's just like, so no sorry yeah uh, i'll just <laughs> point there um now you can mention mindfulness pretty much anywhere and like people know yeah it. yeah 
I guess that, you know, yoga is like democratized, but it's such a small yeah. part of the, of, you know, the practice. So, you know, you would have asanas and yoga studios and that's amazing, but the whole practice, which is like mantra chanting and uh, meditation, it, it's still like a bit, you know, people are still a bit scared about it, I feel, but the fact yeah. that we are bringing it to technology and, you know, to this kind of immersive experience i feel like you know it has like so much potential because people are maybe less scared of it and you know they can experience it on their own and they don't have to you know chant the the mantras and stuff but um sure but yeah i feel like you know there's a definitely i don't know i feel like we are at the beginning of a new era and and it's it's just like you know people come to it and and yeah the more we're going to use technology for it it will bring more people to to practice i guess um mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think the technology has a way of democratizing things too right it's makes it like especially when it's familiar technology you know what i mean that people are using every day like you put an app on someone's phone um mm. it's easier to transition into these um kind of hybrid practices i think um in some ways can be a deterrent as well but if used correctly um media has the ability to kind of bring on these new practices to people um, in ways that are comfortable, I think. Yeah. And I guess that um, another question would be, you know, this this year, there's actually, well, coming back to uh, Chayotish and uh, Vedic astrology, there's, we're entering the age of Aquarius, which is, um, you know, the, the planet Saturn takes 30 years to um, rotate to orbit. Um, the sun and we are you know it's entering a new sign and you know Saturn is like in mythology it rules um, order and governments and uh, structure and you know um, yeah and so Aquarius is like the new age of technology and um, community and stuff like that and so it feels like you know we we are entering that new space of you know taking care of people and using technology how do we you know, we've, we've been working on stuff so far and we've, you know, we had like all this massive amount of information and now it's just, you know, it's just too much and we've got to put some order to it and just like select the right things and use technology to do the right thing. And I feel like, you know, coming back to this tradition of knowing your body and knowing your mind and, you know, be respectful of the environment and being kind to, you know, the planet and the animals and stuff like that. And, yeah, it feels like, you know, we, the two worlds are going to collide and, you know, we have to make something out of it. And so, yeah, so I guess that, you know, my question is, how do you think we're going to push the mindfulness practice? Like, how do you see it, um, you know, in, in 10 years, 20 years time? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I guess, and, and that's, uh, so, uh, the age started in 2020. Is that how that has that worked? Like technically? Or? Yeah, yeah. So it started um, exactly okay. in in um, March, actually. And okay. yeah, well, no, sorry. So the Saturn entered Aquarius in December 2019, and then it came it came back to Cap Capricorn uh, in March for a couple of months, and we entering it officially. So basically, you know, the retrograde thing is like. Um, when a planet uh, orbits, uh, at some point when it passes the Earth, uh, we are there's a, like an optical effect of you know it uh, passing it next to us, and when we look at it, it feels like um, it, it goes retrograde. So that's phenomena. And so once it passed, you know that certain point. I mean, it's a bit more technical, but that's basically the idea. Um, it goes direct again, and so the direct again will happen in. Um, December this year, 2020. So it's interesting uh, with the dichotomy of how things are going, for, or, like around the world, eh? Um, but yeah, no, I think that's uh, yeah. I mean, I think optimistically, I'd like to say, I'd like to think that like as technology becomes more ubiquitous, I hope that the will, the platform for mindfulness will grow with it, right? So, you know, even kind of as a technologist, I, I hypothesize around how technology is going to interact with our lives, um, and it's quite possible now that, you know, there'll be the same technological agents that'll follow us throughout the day, right? You know, in our cars, there's gonna be, you know, conversational AI potentially in our homes, you know what I mean? That 
you know, there's, there's these, you know, there, there hopefully could be this continuity between like home and, and, you know, work and wherever you go, uh, where technology can follow you and that continuity hopefully can provide you with the same benefits, right? So potentially there could be things that could be reminding you to do mindfulness based um, activities throughout your day. Um, mm -hmm. and hopefully that'll improve as technology becomes more um, kind of fluent, right? So you're walking through your house and there's a voice that reminds you to, you know, walk slower or, or eat slower, or you know what I mean? Like these, these are all things that yeah. can be enabled um, with text kind of growth. Uh, I think that the challenge is there's so much competition uh, around um, all these different industries that um, the continuity is difficult, right? It's not like there's one, you know, mindfulness agent, right? That'll kind of follow yeah. you. But, um, but yeah, I, th I think I, I, I'm optimistic about where it can go. I think that um, even like apps like Headspace, you know what I mean? Um, which is technically one of our competitors, but it's an amazing product, right? And it, um, and it changed people's lives, right? Because it's, it, it brought meditation to, a, and it made it very easy for people, right? Um, so I think like those types of case studies will continue um, and I hope they'll become better and more effective and, um, you know, more, more ubiquitous as, as, as technology grows. Oh, um, yeah, that's great. I, re I really like this side of, you know, using technology. Um, I'm really interested in that. And yeah, I'm researching, um, you know, this exactly at the minute. And um, yeah, just like how, how, how are we going to use this all these powerful tools like AI and stuff to our benefit instead of you know trying to sell things to people and uh, you know just using it for that and like pushing all this information just use it for good um, so so yeah so I'm doing that and um, yeah very interesting um, I guess that I'd like to come back to the AI question so how do you how do you use it technically like how does it work how do you interact you know where is the machine interacting with the user, I guess, yeah. uh, during your program? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we use what's called reinforcement learning, which is a type of machine learning um, that a um, computer agent will navigate um, the user's kind of um, musical experience, like almost a game, right? Where there's a reward and a penalty depending on how well um, the agent decides. So for an ex uh, what we do is at the beginning of each user experience, we do a check-in, um, kind of assessing the user's emotional state, right? So we have either a self-reporting system, um, we have a voice check-in that we're experimenting with, and then we have facial recognition as well, that these are all options that the user can, can choose to, to select. Um, so they do this at the beginning of the experience. During the user experience, um, if they're feeling that it's not working, they're able to kind of interrupt the system and, and Kind of like update it and let it know that it's you know not getting them in the right direction and then the agent can kind of uh, adapt accordingly um, and then at the end of the experience we do another check in so basically through multiple iterations of this we've trained the system to kind of um, predict what the best music is to, depending on kind of what your starting point is and and you know and it'll it ideally predicts kind of what your your outcome will be um, based on, on mm. selection and so I mean, when we first started this uh, a couple of years ago, it was really bad, right? It was it wasn't working, um, and and we we kept it in a lab for about you know a couple of years uh, until well about a year and a half or so until like it was training to a point where it was becoming intuitive, right? Um, so, but six months ago, yeah, January, uh, we launched the product uh, publicly uh, because the agent now at this point um, was recommending in very predictable like in in good ways. It was it was it was helping people. Yeah. Um, and uh, right now, um, like we're, we're seeing on average decreases of anxiety of around 65% from beginning to end of experience. Um, and, uh, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite, it's, the performance is quite high and it's, it's getting better every time that people use it, right? But, um, but at first it was, it was definitely a mess. And the interesting thing too is there's a, kind of a personalization factor too, right? So um, we have kind of this model that has been trained on every single person that's ever used it. Um, but then it also learns, you know, specifics of, of what works for each individual too, right? So there's this kind of concept called like the network effect, right? Which is mm. you know, what, you know, and, and the cool thing is when you look at that network effect, you can see things that unite us uh, in our musical experiences too, right? Which is quite beautiful as well. Um, 
so to see things like like rules right between all different people um because you know despite having an age demographic we have uh we have no like specifics in terms of demographic of you know race and background and, and so you can see these really beautiful uh similarities between people uh, when it comes to the, the therapeutic music experience but yeah that's essentially kind of in short how the ai works is it um it learns based on experience right um, mm, so mm. um so yeah you can imagine when it, when we first you know created it it was um making a lot of mistakes kind of like a, oh. a child learn or something right um, so very interesting um i guess i have two more questions um so in the beginning how did you select the music like the sound mm -hmm. to to reduce anxiety and then what is i guess what is um do you have like any kind of um step back on um you know what kind what, what kind of music people prefer or what kind of music produces the most anxiety the most or some you know you yeah know I mean? yeah so uh, those are those, so that's interesting so we're actually we're building out this whole other side of our platform right now um around those insights right like trying to figure out now let's take all of this data that we've created and let's figure out you know what are these high level insights um you know are are there is there a formula you know what i mean for anxiety reducing music and yeah. and it's kind of interesting and, and it's one of our big research uh you know hypotheses and um i for sure thought that there kind of was at the beginning right i thought like there is like you know there is anxiety reducing music but i've, I've been continuously proven wrong over time um because the the interesting thing is is there there like it it's also it's so dependent on where the user starts so if a user is in you know a a tense you know panic state um there is like there there's a specific type of music depend like for that user that will help right um it's like it, it's kind of i don't know if you've heard of uh, the iso principle uh, but it's a music therapy concept that um you can't just play calming music if you want somebody to calm down necessarily right because if somebody's so far away from that mental state um that you know playing the calm music it'd be it might be difficult to train that user to get them to go mm. to that right so it's um yeah it, so I, i guess the short answer is no um we haven't found that there's like a specific type of music that is more calming than others um i would say like there's music that you know in terms of the music we put on our platform we try to make it as variable as possible um we um so we, we have two different streams of content we have content we've sourced and licensed um which is kind of multi genre um and then there's content that we've created in house which is kind of this hybrid genre i would say of of like multitudes of different types of influences um and and we're we're constantly iterating on both but the music that we compose in house we actually use data from our our machine learning to like inform our composers how to create content essentially it's mm. like like here's the musical features that you should use tempo brightness you know um so Yeah, so, so essentially what we're trying to do is create fit for purpose anxiety music um you know while introducing users to stuff that's outside of the traditional norms, right? So yeah, I mean we uh, I think like we were you know once we get a little bigger we're you know we're considering you know eventually getting music from different labels on there as well um because people tend to resonate and get therapeutic outcomes from all kinds of different content. Right? So mm. I guess yeah, I I think uh, I I don't I don't know if there is ever going to be you know traditional music therapy but I think the when you turn music into functional music it's it's when you're using it for a specific use case that's kind of what I'm thinking but I guess we'll find mm. out as we go I guess and do you use like I I've been like listening a lot of you know binaural beats as, as yes. well like you know it's, you've got different frequencies for mm. you know each of your chakras and stuff like that and you know it resonates with uh, different parts of your body and are you using that kind of stuff yeah yeah so that's the other thing that we use aside from the music we have a layer of aud uh, auditory beat stimulation um that's infused with the music so uh that's another therapeutic driver that we use um so we'll we we'll use binaural beats um and it's uh, depending on on again um where the user is and what their outcome is going to be right so like uh, like ideally we always want to get a user to like a 4 hertz you know kind of space depend like if they want to deescalate anxiety but if they're you know in this like very very high um you know noisy place um you can't just start with 4 hertz right so so yeah there's algorithms that we've designed around that too um but yeah we I, we've noticed um quite a bit of a difference when you have like a group that listens to just music and a group that listens to music with binaural beats um it's it's been 
um, it's definitely something that's been proven scientifically a number of times too. So it's one of those cool practices that have been used in um, both the pseudoscience and scientific community. Um, and I always get excited about those because um, it's, I don't know, the, there's always so much conflict between the two, but um, it's, it's funny when they work together, you know, um, the spiritual and the, the scientific people. It's, it's kind of beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, um, yeah, I feel like we should uh, we should definitely. I mean, there's like definitely place for that um, in the future, oh, yeah. especially sure. now. Um, especially, you know, with that all that um, lockdown thing. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but for me, it's just like gave me definitely more time for my practice, and I feel like. So yeah, much time. <laughs> yeah, so, so much, much time. Yeah. yeah. And it, even though it's picking up again at the moment, it's just, you know, it's going, um, activity is coming back. But um, I feel like, I, you know, I don't want to go back to the way things were before in terms of, you know, just not holding space. And um, yeah, yeah, the, the speed of life slowed down, right? And it's, uh, it's kind of a good, it's, I think it's a good thing in some ways. Um, obviously, the global pandemic wasn't a good thing necessarily, but. Um, the yeah. silver lining, I think, is the fact that um, a lot of people were able to slow down their kind of pace. Um, so that's good. I think so, some people have used that time in, in a good way. Um, yeah, sure. that's great. All right. So I think that, I think that we almost uh, need to wrap up. Um, sure. I guess that do you want to talk to talk, talk to us? Oh, Mercury retrograde. And, um, <laughs> talk to us a little bit about just your personal practice, because I'm curious. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So my personal practice, um, I, 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 I tend to do a lot of meditation. Um, I, I've been really enjoying doing it out, outdoors uh, these days, now that it's a lot nicer, uh, at least here in Canada, um, mm -hmm. which there's like for you. But um, so, yeah, I'll go to like some like neighborhood parks and, and just kind of meditate there. Um, I tend to enjoy kind of the sounds of the city. Um, surprisingly, uh, as a part of my meditative practice, I find it very soothing. Um, and I also try it. So for me, mindfulness, just kind of general mindfulness is something that I, I try to continue to abide by. Mindful eating is a big one for me because I tend to be a fast eater unless I like force myself to mindfully uh, eat, um, which is mm -hmm. obviously a lot better for your health as well to slow your eating down. But um, even just kind of the process of like, you know, what does this taste like? And kind of enjoying your meals uh, is a big one for me. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think the other thing is, uh, although I'm a technologist and I would say that's kind of, technology is a big part of my life. I try to make sure that I, I have unplugged time, um, which, you know, is kind of, again, ironic, uh, considering what I do for a living, but I think that even, even our app users, um, we recommend that they, they do time outside of, outside of app and outside of phone, you know, uh, it's, it's good for the brain to think to that. So. I've been getting into reading, um, which I find is a very mindful practice uh, for me. I, I, when I started Lucid and the startup was kind of in its infancy. I didn't have time for much of anything, but now um, I'm forcing myself to build these practices again. Um, Great, sounds good. Um, why Lucid? Uh, why Lucid the name or? Yeah, the, the name. Yeah, so um, the name, um, is uh it's funny so a lot of people thought it had inspirations from lucid dreaming um which it doesn't uh but uh, for me lucid is kind of the state of mind that we hope to elicit in people like lucidity right like that mm -hmm. clear-headedness you know centeredness um awareness and, uh, yeah uh, all of our all, all of our products aim to bring people to that place mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of where the name came from yeah. fantastic well thank you um yeah, and just to finish, I guess that yeah, I just like I would just like to, um, yeah, finish on that thing that you said about like taking some time out because you know we've all been working online and with technology and you know we're both like into into it and I'm doing yeah. that as well like as an artist and I feel like the most effective thing is just like having a room where you don't have any device, so like mm -hmm. no watch, no phone. Uh, no laptop, yeah. nothing like not having this um, thing on your shoulder that you know you're always susceptible to receive like notifications and stuff like that. And oh, for sure. and so for me, it's just like the most effective thing. Like I've got you know I've got no device in my bedroom, and it's just so amazing to have like you know that space. And 
and I feel like you know it gives me more inspiration to come back to it like once you know once I have my window of technology mm. and yeah I'm more inspired and I'm more inclined to do productive things and uh, so I guess yeah. that yeah it's very important and I feel like you know for the future as well that's something that we have to be very mindful of like yeah using technology is just um we have to be careful with it like there's so mm -hmm. so many things we have so much information and yeah we need to be very disciplined and yeah just take some time out and uh, yeah listen to binaural beats <laughs> sure, well. yeah yeah definitely um, yeah cool good well yeah. thank you so much very interesting Thanks. sorry that um steven didn't show up oh, that's good. Um, yeah that's a good, good conversation yeah, yeah i think so too so yeah i'm looking forward to um uh, checking you up and yeah i'll have definitely have a look so yeah thank you thank you, thank you.